Right. Thank you for that extended introduction, uh, far more than I deserve, but thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to chat about this today. So uh, I'm going to talk about working towards a computational model of scientific discovery. Uh, that's the overview, but uh, I'll just skip that. So just to point out in general that this talk is experimental in at least a couple of ways. So I'm just, for the first time, I've never done this kind of thing before, but I'm just trying it out, exploring the public strategy of historical episodes. And so I'm just really exploring the viability of such an idea. I'm, just thing. I'm not a historian, I'm, I'm a philosopher and applied mathematician. Uh, so I'm using the historical work by two people, Whitaker and Darigal, uh, and I'm pulling summaries of their stories about uh, of history and trying to uh, do uh, model the reasoning process of, as a kind of algorithm. And for simplicity, I'm focusing only on mathematical and geometric aspects of theory construction. So just for a very brief uh, background for the philosophical context of this, uh, Hans Reichenbach has this famous epistemological distinction, which is very often uh, not his actual uh, distinction in the way that it's described, uh, but in his way of thinking about it, apparently, according to ever heard, uh, this is the context of justification on one side, which involves objective relations among premises and conclusions. So that's something that is very well defined. Philosophers like that, and, can, and that's a subject for proper philosophical inquiry. Discovery, on the other hand, involves subjective ways of discovering those relations. Not so much uh, can be done in terms of precise philosophical work that was regarded as an empirical uh, subject area. So there was really, a, in 20th century philosophy of science, a subject distinction between justification as philosophers, uh, discovery is, is, is empirical work. Uh, Hempel had this view that he expressed in 85. There could be no general argument, argument rules for scientific discovery. So this is now something that's being called into question so with Ernest Davis's talk yesterday. In particular, uh, and but also current work in, in uh, automatic discovery results in computational science. So this traditional view is now challenged in a number of ways. It's lots of people it reject uh, the old story, uh, and if you want some details, there's a very SCP article on it. Uh, so some of the possibilities are methodological patterns, analogical reasoning, mental modeling, and heuristic search. So what I'm doing is a little bit different, but it incorporates features of a number of these approaches. So my approach is to pick the mathematical and geometric aspects of theory construction, something definite uh, you can uh, pin, uh, pin down, and show that a simple algorithm can re reconstruct the basic methodological patterns. And I'll try and give a bona fide algorithm that, that does it. The hypothesis, there's an algorithmic component to the reasoning used to discover many scientific theories. And I'm gonna give two examples uh, one in optics and one in electromagnetic theory. So I'm not saying the whole process is algorithmic, I'm saying there's a component of it that's, that's algorithmic. Proposals, we can model this algorithmic component in terms of a theoretical framework, which could be mathematical or geometric. We need geometric uh, for Faraday's work, as you see. Uh, what I'm calling hypothesis trees, it's just a convenient way of modeling the reasoning structure. So there'll be rooted trees with general, model, model, general modeling hypotheses at the root, and subtrees, so that where there's branching, there are different theoretical options that are live, and you're trying to reduce it to one branch uh, that's consistent with all these experimental constraints. And I'm assuming the experimental constraints can be interpreted in the theoretical frameworks to be genuine constraints on a possible solution. So that's the basic picture of a hypothesis tree. The root hypothesis is some general uh, thing which is defining a theoretical framework. It's not part of the theoretical framework itself. So that's this root hypothesis at the top. Analogy is often playing a role in picking that. The magenta box is then all in the theoretical framework. So you have certain theoretical constraints which have to hold for any viable uh, theory, which, so a, a nice example of that kind of thing is uh, conservation laws for continuum dynamics. Uh, branch hypotheses then are different possible theories that are independent from one another. You're trying to decide between them. And then you can compute implications of those. Those are the computed subtrees, and there'd be hypotheses that you might choose uh, in the subtrees as well. So that's the basic model I'm using. Okay, so now to give a very brief 
uh, snapshot of uh, discovery of wave optics. So it's just part of the story, it's not the whole thing or anything like that. Uh, but it's helpful, I think, to pick up some of the patterns, I think. So the history of wave optics is long and complex, obviously. Uh, we're just going to jump into the point right at the end where the root hypothesis uh, was the assumption about the constitution of the ether uh, that would determine the uh, light behavior as a wave. So it was, assuming, it was assumed at the time that it was an elastic fluid, ether model. And in that kind of a model, you can only have longitudinal vibrations, so like sound waves. Uh, and Arago discovers that rays are polarized, rays polarized in perpendicular planes don't interfere with one another. So the understanding was for longitudinal vibrations, that's not possible. So it was interpreted to imply that light waves were transverse. So we have to toss out that root hypothesis and replace it with another one. Okay. So this led to a proposal for a new route, an elastic solid model. Since elastic solids phenomenologically were known to support transverse vibrations, uh, it, but it introduced two theoretical options. It's, so this is in the context of uh, double refraction, so birefringent crystals, which for most axes, an incident beam will get split into two polarized beams. But for a particular axis, there's only one beam. And when the plane of, inc uh, plane of incidence uh, maps up with that axis to find the plane, that plane is called the plane of polarization. So it had to be defined without the usual notion of polarization because uh, we didn't know light was electromagnetic wave this time. The important thing for our purposes is it introduced two possibilities. So the vibrations transverse could be parallel to the plane of polarization or perpendicular to it. So that's the first branching. Uh, so both options were investigated sometimes by the same researcher. Now an interesting uh, sub-story here that's important. As Fresnel derived two phenomenological relations, relations between phenomenological quantities, uh, that uh, specify the behavior of reflection and reflection of pol polarized light at the boundary of two media. So the argument that he used is interesting, and it's the first example of the pattern that we're going to see. So it introduced relations between imper empirical quantities, and it was quickly seen that these are very well confirmed by experiment. But they were derived to account for results from experiment. And so what he, what he actually did is, if I, I want to recover these experimental results, what assumptions do I have to make in order to recover them? So he figured out that certain boundary conditions and the perpendicular vibration hypothesis enabled him to recover the experimental results and reduce these constraints. But because they were so uh, well confirmed by experiment, it actually doesn't matter how he came up with them. They then became constraints on the possible valid theory, whether or not his assumptions for getting them were right or not. But there's a kind of uh, solution of an inverse sub-problem here by figuring out what, well, what assumptions can I make to recover the experimental results. So yeah, his laws became experimental constraints on a valid theory. Uh, so up until this point, there, there weren't actually equations of motions for an elastic solid, for an ordinary elastic solid. Uh, Cauchy was the one who derived them. Uh, but they had lots of free parameters, uh, depending on various properties. So ended up producing two separate theories, one for parallel vibration, one for perpendicular vibration, and a bunch of different sub-theories. Uh, so again, so this is the same kind of argument Fr Fresnel was using, solving an inverse problem. Well, what parameters can I choose to recover crystal optic experiments? So that was his first strategy. But then the result was inconsistent with reflection and refraction experiments. So he choose, chose weird boundary conditions to be able to recover Fresnel's laws. And then he got something that kind of fit together, but he still had these two independent theories that he couldn't decide. Right? And the relations and the boundary conditions weren't physically motivated. They were just designed to recover the experimental data. So it follows a strategy of choosing assumptions to satisfy empirical constraints. It's in sort of solving the inverse problem. Uh, then an important step in clearing things up, uh, Green derived physical boundary conditions for real elastic solids using general dynamical principles. So it wasn't assuming any particular hypothesis for a vibration direction. Uh, and he showed that the displacement and stress had to be continuous at the boundaries between media. So this means that the, any assumption of elastic solid 
implies these boundary conditions. So it, it actually sticks in a theoretical constraint above the branching. Uh, so from these boundary conditions, basically he showed uh, with certain assumptions you can recover the sine law, but you can't get the tangent law. So something's gone wrong, we're going to have to toss something out. So interestingly, there were two different ways people responded to this. One uh, was to, okay, we've got to throw out that last root, root assumption of an elastic solid. It's inconsistent with the experiment. So we'll look at a different kind of an elastic solid. That's what we call it. And eventually he got something consistent with the experiment. But Green, on the other hand, he's like, well, no, there was this other uh, elastic solid theory that we discarded a while ago because we thought it was unstable, the medium was unstable. But if I interpret it this other way, maybe it could make it work. And so he did that. So he ended up with two at that stage consistent with experiments. So that's just part of the story, and the algorithm continues. So that's the first picture, our first historical episode. Sorry for the rapidity with which I'm going through this, but I'm trying to give a summary of the historical data I'm trying to cover. So second example, a snapshot of electromagnetic theory discovery. So again, it's long and complicated. Fortunately, in this case, so much work was done by uh, Faraday, Maxwell, and Thompson. So Thompson being Lord Kelvin. Uh, I can usefully focus on their work. So worth mentioning just as further historical background, uh, electricity and magnetism are originally two independent fields. With Ersted's discovery, the current carrying wire deflects the needle <coughs> compass, show that they're related. So it initiated the study of electromagnetism. <coughs> okay. So the first part I'm just going to talk about where Faraday's ideas come from. So he has these lines of electric and magnetic force. So I'll say a little bit about where they come from, because his theory is actually proved to be extremely important for the mathematization of the theory. So he discovers magnetic induction, the variation of current in a circuit induces current in a nearby circuit. So he's really excited about this, and then went on to study it and try to explain it. So using an analogy, so again, this is a root hypothesis kind of assumption using an analogy. So you, if you ever looked at a magnetic field produced by a magnet by sprinkling iron filings on, on a glass, it's very suggestive that there are lines of force that are pushing the iron filings along uh, particular curves. So he came up with this geometric idea that there are lines of force, and that's what's explaining the transmission of uh, magnetic action. So he came up with this geometric concept that all of a sudden su suggests theoretical possibilities that I can then investigate by constructing experiments to test them. And what made his approach so effective is he had such a flexible experimental strategy, he could vary the experiments to test all the different you know, uh, possibility, theoretical possibilities he could come up with. And going through this process back and forth, ensuring that his theoretical ideas would be agreeing with every experiment that he could possibly do. So it's implicitly solving an inverse problem in the same kind of way, except it's this cycling back and forth, variation of an idea, testing, morphing, fitting, and then uh, ensuring that you have th uh, theoretical ideas that fit all the experiments. So just in a, as an example of the kind of thing, you end up refining the idea, and you get a sort of standard quality quantity, of, so it's basically defined by natural units, and you can use that concept to explain other concepts. So electromagnetic force, force generated in a wire, when you move a magnet in its vicinity, the EMF generated is, can be measured precisely in terms of unit lines of force intersecting the wire per second. So that's an example. On the other side, he's got electric lines of force. But, so he didn't have this idea out of a vacuum. <coughs> Instead of an analogy to of, of some kind of phenomenal, uh, phenomenal experience like iron filings, this time he, he drew an analogy to his own theory. So you need to have theoretical harmony for him, which is natural, and it was experimental properties of dielectrics that were forcing uh, the, or, or picking up the basic properties of uh, electric lines of force. So he develops a theory of electric lines of force using the same approach as he did for magnetic lines of force. Excuse me. So again, it's this solving an inverse problem, but he's got his hand in both theory and experiments, and he quickly developed very sophisticated ideas. Okay, so 
The major significance of Faraday's idea is that they were so carefully devised and consistent with experiment, they could serve as a surrogate for agreement with experiment. So if you can recover Faraday's theories, you know your theory is going to agree with experiment. So, and interestingly, Thompson would later reveal that Faraday actually, so for Faraday, someone who has no mathematical training, he was self-taught, didn't know mathematics, uh, through this way of developing theories, uh, reasoned himself to the geometric equivalence of difficult mathematical theorems, which Thompson was able to prove rigorously later on. So it's quite remarkable. Uh, so the upshot then is that Faraday's theories act as, a, as geometric constraints on a valid mathematical theory of electromagnetic. So the initial mathematization steps by Thomson and Maxwell involved converting Faraday's work into a mathematical form. So it started in a piecemeal kind of way, covering little bits of it. Uh, and I think the ori original work that uh, Thomson did, he was 16. Uh, and when he showed that you can map vec vector analysis onto a Faraday's theory uh, in, a, in the context of electrostatics. And he did that by using an analogy uh, between steady state heat flow and electrostatics that he'd already established, you can prove these theories equivalent because you have uh, the Laplace equation holding in both cases. Um, so he drew an analogy between the steady state heat flow and lines of force. So he was able to find a mathematical description relating it to a differential equation for a, a basic part of Faraday's theory. So this provided a number of things. Uh, but the most important thing for our purposes is that it showed that mathematical analogies, so here's steady state heat flow, can be used to mathematize Faraday's ideas. So that was the germ of the idea that allowed Faraday's geometric theory to be converted into differential equations. Uh, so, I'm just wondering if I should skip forward a little bit. But, uh, so Maxwell used a different root hypothesis, steady state hydrodynamic analogy, to recover Thompson's work. So now Thompson has differential equations that are equivalent to part of Faraday's ideas. They, they serve as essentially as constraints now on a valid, uh, more, more broad theory of electric, uh, electric, magnet, electric and magnetic phenomena. So this more general an analogy got him Thompson's work and more of Faraday's. So he treated a more general case, considering sources and sinks, uh, using uh, some of Faraday's experimental results allowed him to figure out a kind of assumption he should make for this hydrodynamic analogy, which would enable him to map on lines of force to uh, flow lines. So on the basis of this one general hydrodynamic analogy, he constructed different representations that are independent of one another. All of the basic things are interpreted in different ways, but electrostatics is one theory, magnetism another, electric currents and another. So you have differential equations for each of these. And again, because uh, Faraday's theory is a surrogate for experiment, these then pieces become constraints on a broader theory. They become differential equation constraints on a more general differential equation. So the result is enabled Faraday's induction law to be stated as a differential equation. You've got Ampere's law as we know it now. And uh, really interestingly, historically, is it made the physical meaning of the divergence of curl operators apparent for the first time, which wasn't clear before that. So Maxwell now had a patchwork of theories validated largely on account of Faraday's work. Um, then the next step was to introduce dynamics. Uh, so it introduced yet another root hypothesis. Um, so Thompson did some initial work, and then Maxwell famously has his mechanical model uh, that he designed the properties of the mechanical model so that all of those other piecemeal differential equations would be recoverable. And it turned out the constraints were enough to determine the model. So the initial result was the first form of three of Maxwell's laws. Uh, excuse me, other relations are implied. Um, it's the equation for involving the displacement term. Um, so, and, and this famously applied the existence of electro electro electromagnetic waves traveling at the speed of light. Uh, <coughs> so, hopefully you can start to see the kind of the pattern going on. So I'll just now very briefly give uh, the basic operations for an algorithm I'm calling fine theory. 
which I, I think can recover the basic pattern in all, involved in all these cases. So I've got a bunch of subroutines that I'm unspecified at this point, but uh, <laughs> you get the idea. So root hypothesis is an abstraction root hypothesis. Analogy is playing a role in every single case. Uh, compute trees, you just need to compute consequences. Uh, if you, to see if something's consistent, if there's an inconsistency, you've got to prune some branch uh, to, to uh, restore consistency. Uh, and if someone does some experimental work and you bring in a new constraint, then there has to be an operation for that. Those are the basic operations. Then there's some special ones. Uh, so you need to be able to write to the tree as well. So for this solution of an inverse problem uh, pattern, you've got a subroutine for that. Uh, and then adding a theoretical constraint like uh, Green did, so for the physical boundary conditions for an elastic solid, uh, Ether model inserts that internal node, so you need a routine for that. And then to recover things like uh, Fresnel's argument of the same general pattern, but in a more restricted area, you've got a recursive call to the same function. Um, and parallel considerations, so some other researcher considers a new uh, root hypothesis like McCullough, you can also have a rehearsal re call to, to do that. So then I claim, and I think this is right, this is an example of an algorithm that will then recover these cases. So the idea is that this is now a, a model of the algorithmic component of the reasoning process. So if you have questions about that, um, after, I'm happy to go through it, uh, but uh, just in conclusion, uh, so if this kind of algorithmic modeling strategy stands up to scrutiny, I need to fill in the subroutines to do it uh, fully, but it seems to me it's, it's uh, reasonable. Then you can take this algorithm and test it on new historical cases and see if it fits. If it does fit, great. If not, well, can I modify it to capture that case, right? So you've got a scientific strategy for studying this kind of thing. Uh, but in any case, if there is some success of this, then it indicates that there's a computational search pattern involved in landmark discoveries of theories of physics. So in my view, that motivates a deeper examination of the computational character of the discovery process in the history sense. So that's all I have to say. Thank you.